Holly, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone who's here. Holly, I'm going to need to ask you for extra help today. Okay. Um, I am having particular challenges, and I just want to share with everybody, I was already with a wonderfully prepared uh, digital slideshow, but um, do you see this? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> and that's about yeah, that's about as much as my uh, device is doing right now. It just started misbehaving a few minutes ago. Um, so for those of you who are tuning in, uh, we're going to go with an analog um, evening. I do have another digital device, but it is uh, is about this big. Um, so I've got me. We've got Holly. We have the Q and A. Um, and what I will have to do is just uh, promise you folks um, uh, more detailed information uh, later. Um, likely next week, uh, and um, also, um, also, uh, <laughs> thank you for the comments. I see the comments flying up about Apple updates. Um, indeed, indeed, um, I uh, I didn't know I was consenting to an update right now. Uh, in any case, um, we will also be uh, hosting later this evening. I just want everyone to know at seven thirty um, the IB slash PSEO info night. Um, not hosted by me or my computer. And then um, also this evening at, uh, I believe, 715, uh, for prospective elementary families, I'll be hosting an elementary Q&A uh, for families who have the opportunity to enroll at Great River School in the elementary level. Um, and uh, the, sh the, short, the short of it is, uh, I, I do think we can answer questions this evening and have, um, have, have a more impromptu uh, evening than last week when two fine candidates gave their presentations. Um, uh, and then, and then uh, what I, I, I can still talk about and answer what I was going to speak about this evening. So um, without further ado, uh, Holly, um, yeah. I'm going to need your help, I believe, with the Q&A, though I see we have no cues yet to A. Oh, we have um, a couple but, A's. Yes, but we have, we have a couple, couple chats. Um, nice. And now, Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we do have, uh, well, I know, I know there's snow on the ground in many places in the state. It is a little chilly where I am. So I just thought an extra layer might be nice. Um, and, uh, and I know, Holly, you, you do have access to the slideshow that we usually do. Um, I was constructing a different slideshow. So um, with, with, with that answer, I'll say, we're just going to go live, everybody. Let's go live. Um, let's do let's it. go live. Let's go live. Um, so the, fir the first thing uh, that I know uh, we promised to report on this evening is um, uh, any, any data that we had gathered back from the community regarding adolescent um, in-person versus virtual learning. Um, and uh, in particular, we were looking for getting people's mindsets and um, their qualitative uh, ideas about what, what they're thinking. Um, so I'm going to talk about that, uh, but I also want to identify that um, we did send out um, a communication to the whole community last week um, uh, regarding an incident of uh, hate speech at our school in the ninth grade community meeting. And so um, I just want to identify for folks that I do want to speak about that first, just for a couple of minutes this evening. Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then I will talk a little bit about some of the data we've collected. Um, I just want to, in case, in case you're tuning in and, and you know, your evening meal is on hold until you hear big news. Uh, I want to say this: um, we're not going to be setting any dates or making any large pronouncements this evening about any changes. And so, if you are if you are tuning in for that, um, that is not that is not what's coming this evening. And so, uh, there'll be more there'll be more later, and I'll answer questions definitely tonight. Um, but if you were if you were waiting on that, I don't want to keep you. Uh, unnecessarily glued to the set if you're just sort of waiting for the yes, no, what's the answer? Um, uh, and so, and so I want to I want to say that the information that we shared last week um, about uh, what happened in the ninth grade community meeting, I want to be sensitive to not knowing exactly who is out there watching or um, what they're saying. Um, so I'm only going to refer to what happened in general terms. Um, and then I would guide everybody to look at the letter that we sent out last Thursday early evening. Uh, and it's also in the newsletter if you go to greatriverschool.org forward slash announcements. In the first paragraph of that newsletter, there's a link to the full community letter we sent out. Um, and what I, what I am going to talk about right now, though, is race and racial identity, and specifically that 
Um, I've been saying for several years at least that at Great River School, uh, we are not and cannot promise a bubble that somehow keeps society's challenges out of the school. And that, that goes for also when we have community meetings by Zoom. Um, we can do our best to prepare a community to respond to challenges um, with respect for each other. Uh, and um, what I see is that uh, we have a reminder from um, a chat that was sent and visible to all the community members at the ninth grade community meeting last Wednesday um, that I think was a reminder of uh, really some brutal and violent history uh, of this country and um, was a reminder to me uh, that it's, it's really important for folks who uh, are white identifying or walk through the world um, with all of the armaments of white privilege. Uh, one, of our, one of our candidates last week uh, quoted Utah Phillips. And I know, I know there's a song you can look up where Utah Phillips, um, for all of those out there uh, of you who are white identifying, you can look this song up, tells a story uh, about living with a pacifist in the state of Utah. It's how Utah Phillips got his name. Um, and uh, while living with this, um, with this person, uh, as a young man, um, as a 20, I believe 25 year old, uh, Utah Phillips had just returned from the Korean War. And, um, I, and I believe in the, in the early sixties was uh, introduced to the idea that as he walks through the world um, as a privileged person, uh, there is a history of violence that follows him as a consequence. So um, pri privilege, uh, in particular, the words that qualify uh, at our school as hate speech are words that target other people uh, for their identity. And they're not acceptable. They're not tolerated. And I just want to identify that um, when I'm talking or working with or um, in my experience uh, around uh, groups of white folks, what I notice, the, the, the challenge that I have to move through first is the uh, initial reaction when I witness hate speech to be paralyzed or to not respond or to not know what to do or say. And so I guess I just want to identify that that's part of the privilege of walking through the world as a white identifying person is um, you don't need a plan uh, ostensibly. Um, you, it doesn't occur to you necessarily unless you've thought ahead of time that you're going to need a plan for when you encounter hate speech. And I guess that's what I want to identify for families is that uh, if we're going to build a school that is that is better able to react to situations where um, challenges uh, such as hate speech are going to happen. And, and that's where I'm saying anyone can show up on any day and stream something on the internet, uh, put something on social media, uh, see something on social media, um, come to school and blurt out or say something they heard. Uh, more often than not, I find that students who use um, hate speech at school uh, immediately know that they've crossed a boundary and uh, their families, I, I've yet to meet a family who condones anything that qualifies as hate speech at our school. Um, and specifically anything that targets other people for their identity is what we qualify. So I, I've never been in a family meeting over the last seven years as head of school or 14 years as a teacher, um, an educator, excuse me, seven years before that as a teacher. I've never been in a meeting with a family where a student is being disciplined for crossing a boundary and the family um, uh, shows any, anything other than remorse. And so I guess what I wanna identify is white folks who, who are out there, um, I'm gonna ask that we all uh, take it upon ourselves not to look for a resolution to this situation, but in fact plan for how, how can we do our best? How can our children be prepared to do their best in supporting their community members who, um, for whom hate speech is, is a violent threat. And uh, it's not okay to not have a plan. And so that's, that's where I just wanna identify. Uh, it might start with something as simple as, in a situation, what will I say if, and fill in the blank. And so um, tonight, uh, we're not gonna go through that. It's not, we're not gonna workshop together right now. Um, however, uh, I'm working with a couple community partners um, and uh, gathering up some offerings so that this spring we'll repeat something that we did in the fall, uh, which is um, skills for folks who happen to be raising white identifying kids in a racially unjust America. And when we do that, um, I just, I wanna, I wanna be really clear, 
we're not doing the program to make things um, all resolved and we don't have to worry about racism anymore. I see that it's a necessary step white folks have to take to live up to our current school mission, um, but not, it's not, we're not gonna be complete in any way, um, even when, any when every family goes through this practice at home, but we will be better equipped to address situations like this. Um, so uh, the ninth grade community um, and their uh, really, um, I guess I would say earnest and forthright students. Um, I, I'm, I'm confident they have the tools to make things right for their community. Um, but the reason that we told the whole community about this is because um, I think it's really important that uh, a white majority school with mostly white identifying staff as, as are almost all schools in the state of Minnesota and most schools in the metro area uh, really have to recognize that uh, the, this, this isn't one individual making a verbal mistake. I guess I wanna just speak to the idea that this word and the, the heavy and burdensome threat that it carries for the people that it targets. And, and I guess at this point you could name any of the words that we would qualify as hate speech. So any word that targets another person for their identity, but in particular, um, this word that was put into the chat for the ninth grade community meeting um, carries a real threat of violence. And that is, that is the point at which uh, I need to call on the white folks in our community um, to be the ones that are not appalled by it happening, but know that it's part of the maintenance of our community to address how do we stop this from happening? How do we make sure that our students understand and that we as families understand that, um, especially, especially if you're a white identifying family, uh, not talking about it is not an option for many families. And so, um, uh, and so when you see the invitations, when you see the opportunities to practice skills, when you see the resources that are shared, uh, I'm asking families to practice those things at home. And, um, and uh, it, were we to keep this only to the ninth grade families and ninth grade community and not let all families and community members first through 12th year know about this, I would be concerned uh, that we would be complicit with more quiet or more silence around how do you prepare to reduce the incidence of hate speech? and um, not talking about it or hoping it doesn't happen isn't a plan. So, um, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm also, I don't know if questions will come up or chats will come up, but uh, I, I wanted to say that and hopefully I said it succinctly because um, cause my, notes, my notes went away at six o'clock exactly. Um, and, so, and, then, and then secondly, I know that a lot of folks are tuned in tonight, I think, um, to talk and hear about uh, adolescent data that has come in. So Holly, have you seen any, any questions come in to the Q&A? Any not, cues for Aing? Not yet tonight. Not yet. Okay. Well, we great. The week. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was about our SWEC coordinator position. Has it been filled? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Our SWEC coordinator position is posted open until March 30th. It has not been filled. Um, and then specifically, also, I want to identify that... Uh, the interview process uh, has not begun. And so there are some uh, excellent candidates, I know, and there are still applications coming in. So please pass the word along. Um, Thank you. Again, that, yeah, that student wellness and equity coordinator role is uh, a student facing role and it's one job. And so I just also, I suppose, I think it's important to identify it's not um, the only job that's uh, charged with working on behalf of equity. It is a job focused, however, on some very specific parts of student wellness um, and programs for students that increase educational equity. Uh, so if you know anyone who might be a good fit, please have them apply and go to our website. Thanks, what do you Sam. think, Holly? Okay, great. <laughs> I think there's no questions or chats yet. Oh, okay. Well, um, I am making us a little bit of a visual. And um, there are bar graphs that I'm gonna share, but pie charts are quicker for me to draw. So I'm gonna draw three pie charts. And the pie charts. Eyeballs. <laughs> I'll draw a couple eyeballs too. Okay. Um, the pie charts, uh, they're going to tell a story of um, family answers, uh, student answers, and then um, staff answers. Mm -hmm. And um, very specifically, uh, we asked for folks to rate on a one through five scale. Um, basically, your uh, 
uh, I think, preference slash um, comfort. And specifically, it was a statement. And the statement was, um, distance learning or virtual learning is the best model for me right now. And then one to five. And then the other one was, uh, in-person learning is the best model for me right now, one to five. And what was um, interesting to me was to compare those two. And I'm gonna give a, I'm gonna give a short summary here tonight on these in just a moment. Um, and, and what we're aiming to summarize is um, some basic realities. And so Holly, I don't know if you wanna put these in the chat. Um, I'd love there's to. some bullet points. Okay, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, or write them down and show them on a piece of paper or something. <laughs> um, this recording will be up tomorrow too though, folks. So it's, we're not hiding this information. Um, there's some themes, and one theme is that uh, we have a quite polarized, uh, as as I suspected might be the case, polarized view. Um, about the same number of folks feel very strongly that um, in-person learning is right for them, as feel that distance learning continuing is right for them. In fact, equal numbers completely agree with opposing models, and equal numbers generally agree with opposing models. And so what, what does that look like? Um, specifically, it looks like a community in which we can't just choose one thing to meet the community needs. That's what I mean by polarized, right? Making us choose between one or the other will, will dis, dis, uh, disserve the expressed needs and desires of one half of the community. And so we know there's not an easy, easy way forward at this point. Um, secondly, uh, we witnessed that there are different takes when you compare family answers to student answers to staff answers. And um, those differences among the different de demographics um, are important to recognize. Um, and I think balance. Uh, what I wanna make sure is that um, we, put our, we put our reactions, uh, which we're allowed to have, uh, we put our reactions hopefully through a process where we can consider other people's viewpoints before we communicate, say, publicly or um, widely uh, about what we think is wrong or right about a situation. And what, what, what is he talking about, Sam? What are you saying? Specifically, what I'm saying is, if you really, really want one thing, then please make sure what you say out in the world to the community generally doesn't somehow uh, disinclude or undermine somebody who might literally want the thing that is opposite from you, right? So if you really want your student to be in person, um, it's, it's important, uh, we are looking at all of that data, for instance, and looking at what, what is the driving um, reasoning and rationale for wanting your student to be learning in person, and how can we, as a school, adjust our programming to meet that need. If you really wanna have your student continue to be learning in distance learning, uh, make sure that also, while we look at the challenge uh, and the mindset of why you wanna stay in that model, um, please make sure to speak in a way out in the world that allows other people to exist with their viewpoints too. And so um, what, what I'm going to uh, do is I'm gonna mark um, the responses um, to a distance learning model because um, I think it's telling. Sam, as you go through this, can you tell yes. us how the decisions are being made? That's a question that came in. Yeah, um, so one, one of the slides that um, I will have to send in a screencast that was sent on Thursday afternoon uh, will show uh, the process that we're following uh, follows what we have been posted on our website um, and we updated just in January in terms of the steps we go through. So if you go to greatriverschool.org forward slash return and then um, you scroll down to how we're making decisions, uh, there will be, if you go to that page, I'll show you, it looks just like this. Thank, thank you, everybody. This is feeling a little bit like an episode of, um, of a comedy right now. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, there is a graph uh, that looks a little bit like this um, on our website. And just to, the, just to the right of it, we list out, I believe, um, six steps. Uh, it might be seven. Um, that starts, I believe, with start with an equity lens, identify uh, what groups are most impacted, what groups of people may be historically not represented or underrepresented or under-resourced, and then how, did, how do we impact those groups? Uh, secondly, we gather data from the community. I'm going by memory here, Holly, so you'll have to just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but this is on the website. You don't have to transcribe this at all. Um, we, we gather, we gather, yeah, we gather uh, feedback, we ask questions, 
And then as the data comes in, we look at the data. And then step four is proposing solutions. And just to let you all know right now, we are, um, I guess I would say, just now completing step three. Uh, it was just this afternoon that I was able to take process data because we've spent um, almost frankly the last five business days calling families, following up, and we are close to a 90% re return rate of answers from folks. Uh, so I believe just at about 89%. Um, and then uh, in terms of students and staff, uh, we have a little bit lower participation rate among students, though most of them filled it out uh, during a class period or during, a, during an advisory time. Um, and so at this point, we are uh, complete with most of the family data and then really working with staff to gather the rest of that data. And here in steps four, we propose solutions. We bring those solutions back to the community for feedback in step five. Um, and then we start finalizing solutions in step six. So what does that mean? It means we're gonna be following the decision-making tools of making sure that the proposal for solutions works through uh, myself, making sure that guides and program directors have the information they need to um, make decisions that best meet the needs of students. And so, because we're just right now at the end of that step three of gathering data, um, I know for some of you that might be disappointing news. I know that we sent out a survey on March 5th and um, I will just report that uh, I have been um, not only impressed, but reminded very clearly if I miss, uh, if, I'm, if I miss including this when I'm talking, um, what I've been reminded of is that we're still running a school and we still have conferences and kids, students are still engaging with class and learning. And um, one thing I think is important, uh, I hear the phrase back to school or getting back to school or going, starting school again. Um, it's important to remember that our educators and our students at our school are doing school and that it is in fact, not only as much work as usual, but often more work and new skills and new training. So there's a lot of investment we've put into that time. Um, and I suppose what I wanna do is, uh, you can look at that to see the, how are we doing it? Um, but then second, well, Holly, your notes are just, they're, they're cruising the chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> what, I, what I wanna do, I suppose, is um, if I could just to simplify the answers, Holly, are you able to see my, my bar graph here? I'm seeing it, yeah. Okay, great, good, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna use pink to represent basically um, uh, whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, I'm gonna use pink to represent um, like, uh, no, we don't prefer distance learning. <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully that visual is clear. That, I'm gonna good. use, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna use green to represent, um, we agree or strongly agree with distance learning. And, uh, and <laughs> hopefully, hopefully this is, this is uh, at least acceptable, if not entertaining to everyone in the crowd right now. And I'm gonna use a neutral face because some people did in fact report neutrality, right? So um, we go with, with, uh, with the black marker as the neutral color. We'll go with the pink marker as the, I don't prefer distance learning. And then we'll go with the green as um, I do prefer distance learning. And what I wanna identify is that for family answers, we had um, just below 50% um, preferring distance learning. Uh, for students, we had uh, above 50% by um, uh, a noticeable margin, uh, ne nearly nearly 60% saying uh, they strongly agree or agree distance learning is their best uh, answer. And in terms of staff, uh, I just wanna identify, it was um, closer to 80% of staff that responded. And I wanna say something important about this, 80% of staff that responded said that uh, distance learning is the model that is best for, for them right now. Um, and then specifically, uh, I just wanna note that with an asterisk and the staff asterisk would be that uh, of about the 65 staff who have been surveyed, um, 37 have responded. And so we're still waiting for about half of the responses. And so that reticence to answer, I think may have um, uh, some narrative to explain, but I don't wanna speak for those folks that haven't responded and we're still uh, really working to make it important to gather all the voices and all the data. But what you might notice is that um, in particular, especially for a staff response of 80% saying preferring distance learning, it's gonna be important to know um, how many um, changes we might need to make if we were gonna change models. Uh, I don't foresee um, it being 
likely that we're going to be making a drastic change anytime soon. And specifically, I want to point out that in terms of uh, saying disagree about distance learning, it was an equal number of families uh, that disagreed, um, a smaller number of students that disagreed, a larger neutral, neutral group of students, and a very small sliver of staff that disagreed that distance learning would be a good model to continue. So as you look at that sort of initial data, data I want to just identify that it's important that I make sure this data is both shared with you all. Um, secondly, uh, I think it's important to share that um, after we gather data and propose solutions, it's really important to identify maybe why did these answers come forward? And uh, I also want to say in terms of how do we meet the needs of the folks that really want to go back in person? I'm up for answering that question tonight. And specifically, um, even without a slideshow, uh, I will be um, direct and honest so that you all know what's going on. Um, it's really important for me to say this. And so this is your only take home. Um, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure Holly, I don't know. You all can let Holly and I know if the chat is helping you as Holly chats along. Um, it's really important to say this. We have a model right now that is serving um, some students really well, and at, at the least is serving nearly half, half of the families enough uh, and students enough that uh, they say they'd like to stick with this model. Um, for the families, I notice the qualitative aspect of the families who are answering saying, we would greatly prefer in person. Um, I, wanna, I wanna list a couple of things. One, uh, most of those students and families saying that they're ready for in-person learning in the qualitative aspects of what they list they're looking to get out of in-person learning. We noticed that uh, they're expecting a high degree of social uh, exposure, i.e. they'll get to see the people that they usually see and they'll get to be back in school and, and active and enjoying it. Um, and then secondly, it's important, I think, to understand that um, a change right now in learning models would not look like returning to the school that we remember in 2019. Uh, and so a lot of the outcomes that folks are looking to see, uh, it's important to understand, I think, here that um, when we see that many folks really wanting in-person learning, uh, you know, ne nearly half of families and uh, about a third of students, the comments in of why they want them is that they uh, are, is those answers are describing um, that we would like to see our student seeing their friends again, interacting with their groups again, interacting with their teachers again. And what we know from implementing um, an in-person model for elementary is that uh, it's, it's not only a lot of work in order to implement that model, but um, at the elementary level, uh, we had a much higher uh, degree of um, community buy-in. Uh, and so far at the lower elementary level, uh, lots of students attending in person. And so that transition uh, really was carried by the work of staff pausing what they were doing, changing a lot of things to implement this new model um, for elementary. Now, to do that for the adolescent level um, is, is not a decision to take lightly. And so if you're a family who really wants in-person learning, one thing I know is that uh, we, are, we are really heavily considering that if we were to change our in-person um, events and, and looking at really, especially after spring break, we're looking at gearing up how many times we socialize in person, how many, how many ways and times that all seven through 12th years can either meet uh, each other in community uh, or possibly have teachers be hosting more classes either outdoors or in person. If we stopped right now and tried to change the whole model, uh, it would undermine the effectiveness of that planning and those opportunities in the spring. And the model that I see that many schools are implementing is highly restrictive for student movement and so we want to make sure, and also highly restrictive for how many students those teenagers see in a day. And if not, um, it doesn't match our health and safety outcomes that we need. And so um, it can, I see in the chats, a couple chats that it's disheartening to see that many staff or that many families not be ready to do in-person learning. And I just want to identify, um, I don't see that as meaning that we're not going to gear up and do more in-person activities. And I just want to also be clear, we haven't made a final decision about our model but I, I do want to temper expectations uh, with this flame. And that is we've invested heavily right now in a model that's working for some and working for enough that in order to meet the needs of the folks who need to come in person, we're looking at, are there ways to meet those needs that could 
improve the SRC or change how we're doing the Student Resource Center so that it's more like school on site for the students who are ready to come in. Um, but we can't prematurely announce that we're ready to do that without really getting everybody on board. So that old wisdom of if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Um, again, just as a reminder, like we've been saying since July, it's really important to understand that what we're deciding right now, it's important that we make decisions that allow us to keep going together in the future. We don't wanna make a decision right now that isolates either of the poles of wanting in person or wanting to remain in virtual for the rest of the year. And so um, it's, it's a more complex uh, task in front of us. Okay, I think I got through my talking points. Um, sadly, I have wonderful colleagues who uh, really identified some very important things for me to say uh, tonight. And um, all of those points are on a digital, digital uh, event, but um, we I'm gonna answer questions. Yeah, yes. let's go, Holly. Let's do the questions. Okay, how many students responded? Was it a representative sample? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I won't answer as a statistician, uh, but I will say we have, uh, I believe, um, nearly 70% of students answering. And so statistically, I don't see patterns that would lead us to believe that we are not hearing from a, from a, a group. Um, so um, take what you will from that. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say we have a representative sample yet of staff. And okay. so I think there's I think there's a lot going on that is probably frankly none of my business about staff really considering how to answer that survey we sent out. So Okay, here's another question. What yep. is staff access to vaccines? I'm glad you asked. Um and if anyone is in the audience named Stacy Krieger or Wendy Fisher, feel free to correct me here. Uh, last I checked, um, which was late last week, I think that's last, the last I saw the updated numbers, uh, we were um, just under 60% uh, had had at least one dose of vaccine. So there's two ways to say that that I think is important to recognize. One way to say it is uh, over 56% of our staff have received at least one dose of vaccine, which I think is wonderful news. Another way to say it is less than 60% of our staff have received even one dose of vaccine. And so um, that's the same information. And I just want to identify um, for folks that uh, vaccination is, I think, a really important part of um, safety and, and mitigation, but it, it is not the single fulcrum on which we will, we will use to decide how we do schooling for the rest of the year. Um, we still have those two poles of students and families at home and staff vaccination, I know, doesn't affect them necessarily. Um, so. Ready for another? I am. What would instruction and class time look like if we went back to in-person learning? I'm assuming- Well, so yeah, I'm gonna answer this in two ways. And the, and the first is to say, uh, honestly and earnestly, um, we've shared uh, a couple of the charts in the past about um, who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted when we make decisions. And for the what it looks like, I just wanna point, point very clearly that this is not the guy responsible for designing those solutions. Um, more importantly, uh, however, um, I am accountable to make sure that uh, staff have the resources that they need, that they ask for, um, including, uh, including our program directors who are doing great work right now uh, on keeping a learning model going well and frankly improving on it day to day. So uh, what I know is that at other high schools where I have been doing research, surveying, or talking to other folks. Um, whoa, hold on, Holly, I see there. Sam, oh. Sam is not responsible, is true, but that word responsible, um, hold on, just hold on. <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna be taken in the chat. So, okay. I, um, and I don't know how many folks are like in uh, interested in business 101, but when we're talking about how are you making decisions, the responsible party um, really has, has the agency to make decisions. The accountable party holds the boundaries, makes sure that the that the resources are available, and that and that um, basically the responsible folks both follow through accountably, but have what they need to do the work. There are folks who are consulted, and that would be the community on the whole, and then folks who are informed, and that would be the public and the state and everybody else. And so I just want to put myself for classroom. How would it look? I'm in the accountable role, uh, I believe, and um, the responsible role. I just saying, I'm not making the final decision about the proposal. And so 
Um, if we were going fast uh, to go alone, um, I would be put in that position. And, and at this point, I just wanna be super clear. What would it look like? Here's what it looks like at other schools. Um, students are, uh, I think at the most successful schools, in terms of successful mitigation approaches, students are in smaller cohorts. Uh, they are often limited in their movement around the room um, and or limited in their movement around the building. Uh, they're staying um, at least three feet away, but often six feet away from all of their peers. Uh, lunch is not had in a communal space, but is had in a classroom with a smaller number of students. Um, I know that many schools for adolescent students, uh, because of the number of students still doing distance learning, Students show up in person, the teacher might be in the room, but for all qualitative effects uh, at these other schools that are currently operating that have moved quickly to what they call an in-person model, students are in desks on their computers doing the Zoom class with the teacher right there. So they can still participate the way they would have in Zoom before. More of them are on site, but um, it, you, you can start to see the difficulties in calling that in-person learning. If you were expecting group work, student interaction, freedom of movement around the room, like a Montessori classroom or Montessori adolescent uh, environment would have and socializing with groups throughout the day. Um, that, is, that is not the model that we would offer using the mitigation techniques currently recommended. Um, and so in the background is also the reality that there is a variant that is spreading faster uh, that we know um, spreads uh, uh, among, among uh, adolescents and adults. Um, and we are keeping our eye even now on both case counts regionally and how fast um, and quickly that variant is spreading. And if there's ever any news about it spreading among even younger students, we will have to assess that. So that's part of our baselines. Uh, but we're using the same baselines and the same, um, the same decision points for the adolescent level that we are using also then for the elementary level. And so you can look at those at our website, groverschool.org forward slash return. Um, I, so I just wanna say that was a wide ranging answer. Here's the quick answer. It wouldn't look like pre pandemic to go to school in person. It would be limited group size. It would be more screens than we've ever really had before in the adolescent level to allow adolescents to see the different teachers they see throughout the day in the ninth through 12th year uh, program, especially. And, um, the real, the real factor that I see right now is that we are working internally on ways to offer more in-person experiences for the people who, who need them or want them the most. And I wanna make sure we don't interrupt those resources in order to do something that won't serve the whole community. So um, there you go. Other questions, Holly? <laughs> I'm Ooh. glad we made it through that. I'm sorry, I overspoke. <laughs> well, you just say Sam is not responsible and I just don't want to let that fly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to finish my sentence. It's true, it's true. So I'm accountable, I'm accountable. Yeah. You are, I put that in there. Yeah, um, we'll see. What does it tell you that only two thirds of the staff responded? I have my own assumptions like stress, but what are you mm -hmm. hearing about how staff are doing this year overall? I worry about them. Um, I'm an excellent student. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not seeing, um, oh, oh, I see. Um, uh, I, th I think there's a couple, a couple, uh, r realities about, I'll have to look afterwards and see who these people are answering these questions. I think there's a couple realities about, um, <laughs> uh, there's a couple realities about in-person learning that I think, um, do raise stress levels for staff. Uh, and so one that occurs to me um, at, as a licensed educator myself is the amount of time and energy that goes into thinking, how am I going to do this well for my students? And if we already put that time into thinking about that now uh, for this model, um, I, I would feel um, earnestly often paralyzed thinking about how would I even wrap my head around what that looks like? And so that might, that might pause me from answering. Um, secondly, uh, I will report that, um, as you've heard many places, I think the relationship between um, employees who carry out the work of a school and then the management level of that school, uh, the trust between those two roles have definitely been strained throughout this pandemic. And so um, I don't underestimate that um, folks uh, may, may be reticent to answer. And as long, you know, as, as long as I've been at the school, um, there has been an exceptional degree of openness uh, and 
and I guess I would say um, addressing conflict between uh, managers and employees generally, but um, I don't take for granted that uh, folks may not trust that their answers are, are uh, not going to commit them to something that they're not ready to follow through on. Um, and so uh, that's possible. But, but really, I also see staff who have established, I guess, with those two answers in mind, uh, I see staff who have established uh, a lot of time and energy in making things work now. And for the students for whom are struggling, have also put time and energy into how to reach those students. So um, I, think it's, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that this is an extremely stressful question and set of questions for staff to answer. Also, just to identify, um, we, we worked to keep the staff survey as similar to the family and student survey as possible, uh, as appropriate, so that we were getting similar information. Um, so we didn't ask staff to commit to a working model or, or identify where they would land if we, if we did sh shift our current working model, but um, I, don't, I don't take for granted that some staff may be nervous about that. Um, I see a question here about who does make the final decision. Yes. And I think it's important to identify that um, for a final decision about learning models, I've said, I've said this uh, overall, the how, how do we do the learning model? That's where I've just been really clear. I am accountable for making sure that that how gets answered um, and that folks who have to answer that question have the resources they need. Um, but because uh, I identified that I'm accountable for that but not responsible, I guess I will say for school-wide decisions that infect school-wide programs, Holly, can you see the RACI here? I can um, see. Yes. Good, again, you can, you can Google it so I won't write this out, but responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. Um, for the final decision uh, about school-wide programs, um, your head of school here uh, is in the role of being responsible for deciding. I'm accountable to the school board and the school board is made up of um, 10 folks currently, six of them are licensed teachers. Um, we do have one board opening and um, that school, those school board meetings are public. Uh, and what I see is that, um, the state of Minnesota identified some criteria to use to choose school models, and I'm using those criteria and talking to the board about how those criteria are being used. And then uh, consulted in this category would include um, generally the community, right, but um, staff, students, and families. Uh, and then we have, uh, as we established last summer, just to remind everybody, can you see this, Holly, is this worth me writing down at all? <laughs> we also have um, a COVID advisory that's not a decision-making body, but is. Oh, I lost your voice. Sam. All right, Sam. I lost your voice. Um, those working groups joined the COVID advice. Some of those folks joined the COVID advisory. So the final decision uh, really is the school board could um, intervene and mandate something. Um, at this point though, uh, I'm reporting to the school board and how I'm following state guidance in order to make that happen. Um, those decisions happen. So let's see, I got, I got a couple, I got a couple other who is responsible? So um, uh, thank, thank you for asking, uh, anonymous attendee. Um, Holly, I'm seeing um, someone's asking, who is responsible? Are we able to do smaller cohorts at this time? And um, I will say uh, I'm responsible for making sure that a timeline, a very clear timeline is put out uh, and also responsible for making sure we have a very clear set of how we're gonna make a decision to meet student needs. Uh, and so I'm working with, um, the folks inside uh, internally at school to make sure that that comes out just as soon as we can. And uh, what I'm, what I'm um, working on, uh, I suppose I don't, I don't want to say more because there are people internally who I want to share details with before we come forward. We've really spent the last week making sure we get as many voices as possible included in the feedback so we have the right data to make proposals with. So I, I am, I'm responsible for that work. Uh, the board's accountable to hold, hold me responsible 
uh, for making sure those timelines come forward. Um, and then I see a question here, Holly, about one to two days a week. You want to answer, ask that one? Yes, Sam. Are you yeah. considering, or is Great Bear ever considering, uh, or talking about one to two days a week? Um, and I think right. other question about who is responsible also asks about smaller cohorts. Oh, good. Yeah. So um, I think, yeah, one to two days a week and smaller cohorts, I think, are actually in, the sim in a similar set of categories of um, possible solutions. And some of those possible solutions um, that I see uh, are not, uh, when I say them here, um, I'm not going too far because they are in fact brainstormed uh, possibilities that have been on the wall since back last summer, which is um, there are scenarios in which uh, I could imagine small cohorts uh, opting in to meeting their teacher on site for the class period that's scheduled and that teacher broadcasting the class as an option. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it would be all required, but it would allow groups of students to start coming and learning on campus in, in fact, a less restricted way than if we had everybody doing that same thing. Um, so uh, in terms of smaller cohorts, I also um, identify that uh, at the lower adolescent level, um, there are plans that have been made in the past about keeping students in certain cohorts. Um, and we need to go and consider whether or not that's something we can go, we can go forward with. Um, however, uh, I know that through the year, we've adjusted some of those cohort plans to really meet student learning needs best. And so um, the, the smaller cohort plan is not ready to just flip a switch on and have everybody come to school with. Um, in terms of coming to school one or two days a week, uh, I think that if we put everyone on a schedule to do that, uh, we would start to encounter uh, the polls of folks who are ready to go to school in person and folks who are never gonna go to school in person this year and equal numbers of those folks mean that um, the scheduling and logistics of making sure students are included and everybody's still learning uh, re really is a curveball. And so uh, I'm not ruling it out, but I am saying um, the most fertile ground that I see are solutions for the folks who want or need in-person um, learning. And that's not everybody. And in fact, the folks who strongly, completely agree, I gotta get something in person is, is about 13% of those respondents who answered, uh, both in the student and, this, and the family picture. Um, so that's a smaller number of students. And we, I believe that we can produce uh, successful answers and solutions for those folks. Um, I also um, wanna identify uh, that next week when I've got the tech back up, uh, we will show the disaggregated data, um, so associating uh, responses with, with um, different subgroups and, and demographics, both around socioeconomic status um, and around uh, race. And um, I think uh, th those are two separate subgroups that often sometimes though tell us, are there subgroups that are wanting particular needs met? And part of, part of our um, commitment to an equity lens is to identify uh, are there students in any subgroup who um, need a particular answer? And are those students needs that we need to prioritize? And so that's where I would say too, um, the one to two days a week, uh, I can understand how it sounds so feasible from the perspective of a student, a family, or even a cohort, um, especially through the ninth through 12th grade level with so many different teachers and credit needs. Uh, there are ways in which I think it's gonna be more fertile for us to say, some teachers might start doing more in-person things and students who need in-person things, we're gonna put resources into making sure that those needs are met um, so that we don't upend the whole ship to make sure that one corner of the ship gets what it needs. So that I, I, know, I, I know tonight is not a night for popular answers. Um, and I feel frankly, uh, particularly, uh, the word vulnerable has been used many times in the past couple of years. Um, I feel particularly exposed not having the digital foolery, uh, but um, we we will share we will share out the pie the pie charts and the graphs and 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 uh, all of the details. Um, but I want to make sure that I make it clear that we've really worked to try to get everyone's voices, and that program directors really just saw data today uh, because of how hard we've worked to try to get all voices in while we are teaching and learning and running school and getting ready for uh, conferences for the adolescent level later this week. Which is important to note, if you're listening to this recording or watching, uh, elementary has school this week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So don't not come.
either virtually or in person to elementary school. Any other questions in the Q&A, Holly? Yes. What is right. your comfort level with adolescents resuming sports, including indoor ones, at this point in time? Oh, OK. Well, um, I'm going to defer from being personal about this, unless someone asks again about Sam O'Brien's personal comfort level. Uh, I do know that um, athletics uh, is a place where um, we are practicing when we have practices indoors for things. Uh, we are practicing with all of the recommended guidelines from the CDC and Department of Health, um, including cohorting together and really making sure that testing is happening. Uh, I also know that recent guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health has guided that um, Ella, that, that adolescents especially, but youth sports, they call it, anyone participating in youth sports should be getting tested regularly, early and often. Um, and then specifically, I think that uh, getting tested means that you know if you are an early carrier or an asymptomatic carrier, uh, because there are especially, I think, I think especially right now, the biggest threat to us staying on momentum to come more and more in person is that um, a variant like the B117 or the British variant uh, starts spreading among groups, uh, especially in something like youth sports, and then we don't, we don't know what's happening. Um, however, what I've noticed is that all the reports on there um, well, I'll make sure that I answer this question, um, uh, that, that any, anyone who is participating in the activity is getting tested often. That's what the Department of Health is saying. Um, and so I see a question. I'll just put my, my, my finger to my ear. Uh, not sure we heard you there, Jim. Are you saying we are doing sports inside right now? And so I just want to identify um, uh, varsity sports, varsity athletics, uh, yes. Um, basketball season uh, uh, has happened, um, and uh, and 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 that's where I just identify that the spring sports that I'm aware of happening are outdoors. Um, the varsity sports that would be happening, including ultimate frisbee. So we did do broomball. That's an outdoor sport. Um, but this past this past winter season, uh, yes, we've been doing um, indoor sports and following all guidance per the state high school league. Um, and so that's something that we decided with our um, athletic cooperative schools in order to have those. Um, and so fifth through 12th year students who are interested in ultimate Frisbee, uh, please see the email that went out both on Saturday and last Friday about that. Uh, and um, folks who are interested in spring varsity sports, uh, including um, girls softball, uh, open baseball, um, track and field. Uh, Holly, I'm just coming at a Stand still right now. <laughs> Track and field and, and actually boys volleyball. Um, yeah. Those boys volleyball would be an indoor sport again where we're following all state high school league guidance. And I'm keeping a close eye on any new guidance. Oh, I, I just noticed we're heavily lit. Uh, any new guidance um, specifically uh, coming from the Department of Health um, about uh, any, any pause in athletics and or any change to the testing protocols. Is there a question that has come up since I gave that answer? Yeah. Are we concerned at all about the message it sends that we will do sports inside, but we don't we won't do classes and learning inside? Uh, I think um, very astute uh, listener who asked that question. And um, specifically, I think you have hit uh, very specifically on the tension between uh, risk mitigation, harm reduction, uh, which we talked about last month in this very podcasty show um, uh, and and the reasons why it is um, when folks say uh, what, what's your personal take on on athletics uh, I just want to identify um, we, we've worked through a lot of safety protocols to follow follow them and I, I know every family is making a decision for themselves about the health security of indoor athletics um, so what I do know is that uh, the number of staff and number of moving pieces that have to be executed correctly to do an indoor activity, like a practice indoors, um, that is less to follow all the health guidance than having a full scheduled adolescent school day with that many more people. And so um, I am concerned if someone takes the message away that we're doing sports, we're not doing school. And, and I will say um, one, one of the takeaways from, uh, and this might be a good closer, but one of the key takeaways from a question about if you want in person, but you're not doing SRC right now, why? Uh, the majority of people who answered that question answered with, a, uh, answered with a very clear description of the SRC 
is not like school. My movement's restricted. Most of my class is online. Uh, I can't see the people that I normally see. I'm not there with the people in my classes and my teachers aren't there. And that's what I want to just use as a, as a learning point for us to say, what can we do to actually meet the needs of in-person learners? And I want to just identify right now that if we could, if we could sort of wave a switch or a wand and make it so that that need could be met, we would do that. But the things that are not desired about the SRC are many of the same elements that would be present if we went back to in-person learning tomorrow. And so um, we know that we got to plan something to meet student needs. And um, the reason you're not hearing a start date or a save the date date right now is because we uh, take seriously the need to really meet the needs of students uh, more than uh, an immediate message. And, and so um, I, I believe we can meet the needs of students best if we really take the time we need to communicate with you all how we're gonna meet those needs. And so I wanna thank the 90% of families who have answered us, who have given us information we need. Um, we're still calling and leaving voicemails for the 10% or so of families who haven't responded. Um, and uh, I'll report very clearly back next week though about disaggregated data, making sure those voices are collected. And then, um, uh, you know, I'm gonna open up some anonymous channels to hear from staff too about why might there be a lower staff participation rate? Uh, I, I do believe sharing information keeps us all informed. And even if we feel frustrated, does un let us understand where the other perspectives are coming from. And so I just wanna say, uh, I don't take for granted that anyone who is doing distance learning um, uh, and wants to be in person, that this isn't a really difficult message tonight to hear. And I also don't take for granted that anyone who um, said they wanna keep doing distance learning uh, may not have heard me say all the things they want to hear about about why and how we're doing it. So um, we got to keep hearing from you. Please keep letting us know what you're thinking and seeing. And if you're listening to this on a recording, you can always send your questions to us at office at riverschool.org and also through the anonymous feedback form on our website. So Holly, anything else to add? One more question. Were all grades evenly represented in the surveys? Participation somewhat even between all levels? Um, yes, uh, and um, in fact, uh, the only skew was a little bit higher participation uh, I see among years seven, eight, and nine, um, who tended to want a little more in person than, than the 10, 11, 12. Um, I saw also a, a fair number of, of comments from students um, uh, just, just asking how many days or how many weeks would it be if we went in person, and that's, that's something also that um, we are gauging is we want to make sure we've got, frankly, um, all of the fuel and planning and energy that we need to finish this year very strong, to have the kind of, uh, I believe, options for in-person and outdoor experiences this spring, and then go into next school year, not having spent or borrowed from next school year's planning energy in order to do something drastic this year. So um, I know I'm planting the seeds and sort of laying out low expectation picture for folks who wanted to hear something dramatic about a change tonight. But um, I, want, I want to be very clear that uh, we don't take lightly a decision, nor do we take lightly the responsibility to meet the needs of folks who say they want to be in person. So um, I, I am responsible for working on that. And I will make sure I do my best to get folks the resources that they ask me for and that I, that I, that I know they need. And I got to do, I think, an improved job of providing those resources so we get higher staff participation and we can do what we can together. So all these difficult questions. I hope I, I know overrepresent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh no, I think Holly, look at you. You put a full transcript in there. Thank you so much. Almost. Uh, yeah. Okay, those of you who have been here tonight, uh I thank you for your questions and your honesty and um your patience with digi digitizations and analogness. And so um, I guess I'll say, uh, see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye, Holly. Bye, Sam.